all over the world. It's everywhere. I mean, I've, I've spoken to people in Peru and Chile and El Salvador and uh, Europe and Russia and France. And it's amazing. Everywhere you go, there is this phenomenon of people seeing anomalous, unexplained objects. And how arrogant are we to think that we can just dismiss this phenomenon preemptively by asserting that, well, because there was a strange cloud in the area at the time, that must be the explanation. And indeed, in many ways, I've, I've been taking on some of the sceptics because I, 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 whilst I don't see myself as a UFO or a UAP activist or advocate, I do think science is often dishonest. I think it's often almost deliberately misleading in the way that it contrives to misinterpret data. You know, when you've got, as you've got at the Westall school sighting, Westall High School, 6th of April, 1966, over 200 people, school children, adults, teachers, local market gardeners, they're all looking up in the sky and they see three elliptical metallic disks. And the incredible thing is, and this is the thing that was a real turning point for me with that case, it's one of Australia's most important UFO sightings. I'd always assumed that the explanations that had been offered were a government explanation. I'd always assumed that the claims that it was a, a research balloon were explanations that had been offered up by the government, as often happens. You know, it was a weather balloon. You know, go away, leave us alone. It was a weather balloon. But in fact, I think conspicuously, nobody has ever, from any government agency, despite repeated requests, ever sought to explain what it was that over 200 people saw at the Westall High School on the 6th of April, 1966, at around 10.30 in the morning in broad daylight. Yeah, how can you Nobody discredit that? from government has ever <laughs> sought to explain it. And so the only people who've offered explanations are sceptics who've suggested that because there were American secret testings going on of nuclear radiation over the South Pole using highball balloons, a particular type of high-altitude balloon, that must be it. And look, I found that remotely plausible until I spoke directly to literally dozens of the witnesses. And I suspect if the skeptics did this, they'd feel the same. Because when you do speak to these witnesses, it's quite clear they didn't see a balloon. They didn't see a drone. They didn't see an aeroplane. They know the difference between a balloon, a drone, an aeroplane, and whatever it was that they saw. Terry Peck, who I only spoke to just this evening, was a young girl of 12 at Westall School that day. And she saw one of these objects literally hovering and then lowering itself down behind trees in an area of bushland called the Grange. And she was a plucky little thing. And so she jumped the fence against the protestations of the teachers and ran and ran and ran and made it into the bushland. And when she got there, there were two other girls already there. One of them had fainted from shock. And the other one was just staring with her mouth wide open because they're hovering over the ground in front of Terry and the other girl was this obvious, mechanical, intelligently controlled craft. And the way Terry tells it, it had purpley lights underneath, flickering underneath. And as she and her friend watched, it raised itself to about 30 or 40 feet in the air. And then, interestingly, it, it, it took a 45-degree position and then, bing, instantaneously disappeared into the sky, clearly moving, but just moving so fast your eye couldn't follow it. It would have been absolutely amazing and gold smacking. Yeah, I mean... How do you dismiss something like that? No, 200 Nobody people. has. <laughs> can't. Nobody ever has. And, and this is the thing that really gets me, is that there never has been any government explanation for this. And it's funny, because I mean, I'll, I'll tell you more, that I, I was looking for a government report, like um, a lovely fellow called Shane Ryan, who runs the Westall Facebook page, has yeah. done for many years. And Shane's tried to procure any report that might have been prepared by the Defence Department or one of the precursor departments called the Department of Supply. 
And unfortunately, we've been told by the National Archives, and I think they're being truthful, that the report doesn't exist, that it can't be found inside the government archives. So now, I was elsewhere. prepared to accept that. I was prepared to accept that until, by complete fluke, and this is so serendipitous, it almost gives me a shiver up my spine, I was approached by a source, somebody I've known for a very long time, who worked at a very high level in a very important agency in the federal government, I can't say which. And that person contacted me because they'd become aware of the fact through a newsletter that was being circulated that I was doing a story on the Westall sighting. And he said, why are you doing a story on Westall? And I said, why are you interested? And he said, well, because my father was the guy who wrote the secret report for the Department of Supply. And I said, what? I said, that report doesn't exist. And he said, I can tell you it does because my dad wrote it. And uh, he'd seen his father write it. And in fact, he'd witnessed his father being picked up in a black Humber for several days and being driven off to Westall every day to go and do his field work, to research it with the local military and the local police. And then every night he'd come back and he'd sit on the kitchen table and he'd talk about it with the family, especially the wife. And the young son was picking up all this information. He stored it away in his head. And he knew that his father had a copy of the report in his house for many, many years until he died because he was so profoundly ex uh, excited and shocked by what he'd seen. And this is the thing that amazes me because I was brought to the slow realisation that every now and then, it's so unlikely, but every now and then there really are things called cover-ups. And yeah. this is one of those classic times when I really do think there was a cover-up. I think the government's avoided talking about this issue and it's probably long forgotten about now. But one of the things that really astounded me when we tracked him down was to meet the science teacher who was one of the people on the quadrangle at the school that day in April 1966, a guy called Andrew Greenwood. And 54 years later, Andrew Greenwood told me in interview how he was threatened. He was actually threatened with the loss of his job as a teacher if he continued talking about the Westall sighting. And apparently a man from the Air Force and a man from a civilian agency knocked on his door late one night and basically made a threat that they would say he was a drunk and drinking on the job if he continued publicising the Westall story. Yeah. And so for many, many years he was terrified and he kept quiet about it. But oh, now yeah. in his 70s, he's, he's just bolshy about it and very, very angry that somebody from the Australian government 54, 55 years ago tried to threaten him to keep quiet about what he saw. Yeah. I don't know if you, uh, when you were talking to people in regards to the Westall there, there was a story there, I can't remember where I listened to it too, but um, one of the girls that touched the craft and she got taken away and disappeared. And the girls yeah, went back to I the house you, there. I've, yeah, I've, I've investigated that story. I can't, I can't tell you why I know what I know, but I can tell you, I've investigated that story and I am satisfied that it's a conflation of different stories. And yes, there was a girl who fainted and was taken away in uh, an ambulance, but it had nothing to do with the Westall sighting. And uh, people I know have engaged with that woman who's now a grown woman and uh, her family did move out of the area. Uh, that's, I'm sure, the other thing you were going to tell me. But there's no conspiracy behind it. I've, I've been able to happily satisfy myself that there is a benign, prosaic explanation for why that young girl disappeared from the school and why she was taken away in an ambulance. Uh, okay, because there's more to the story. Sorry, uh, there's more to the story there. Um, the people, the girls, reckon they went to the house there to find the girl, see if she's all right or not, but it's a totally different family and saying that they never lived there. Yeah, again... Again, I've spoken to some of the people that actually went to the house, and uh, the story is somewhat different. Again, as often happens, and this is not in any way to criticise these witnesses, as often happens, his stories get conflated. They get mixed up over the years. And there was a group of girls that went to the young girl's house, not immediately after, but 
weeks after, and the family had moved, as the family always planned to do. She'd left school, and she moved to Queensland, and that's all I can okay. say. Or is it all part of the cover-up? So, uh, look, <laughs> no, 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 no. Look, uh, look, to be honest with you, uh, I, 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 I'm very reluctant to, as- to assume a cover-up, okay? Yeah. In this case, I do believe there was a cover-up at Westall, but I don't think it was the cover-up that a lot of people are talking about. You know, this young girl, there's a perfectly innocent explanation for why she disappeared from the school, and it's nothing to do with a UFO sighting. Yeah. But there was a girl and her name is Terry Peck, and I spoke to her as recently as an hour ago, there was a girl who walked into the Grange and literally held her hand up, and she could feel the heat from this metallic craft that was hovering above the ground noiselessly. She could see the purple lights on its underside. That's a really credible sighting, and she's adamant about what she saw. So, you know, you don't, you know, we, we've got to be very, very careful because, I mean, I, one of the first things I heard was that story about the girl who disappeared from the school shortly after the sighting. And it's it's one of those kind of stories that takes off like 9-11 conspiracies and, you know, yep. Tower 7 conspiracies. And what I've tried to do as much as possible in my research is chase down those stories. And I, I soon discovered and soon learned that there's really nothing to that conspiracy theory but that's not to detract from the fact that there really has been i mean we don't need to make up conspiracies because there really was a conspiracy there really was a cover-up in the westall story just like i assume there was a cover-up in the in the other issue that i think is an incredibly important sighting where there's been multiple sightings is in a place called the harold e holt naval communication station right up in northwest cape in wa 